I am going to talk prophecy tonight. This is probably the most commonly referred to of all the prophecy verses, and that's in the 13th chapter of Revelation. Begin verse 1. And I stood on the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and his great authority. I'm just going to quickly review that verse and tell you the meaning and go on. The beast was like a leopard, that's speaking of the Franco-German Empire, or in not modern times known as the European Union. His feet were as the feet of a bear, that's Russia. The mouth was as the mouth of the lion. The lion is Britain, so we're talking about some great figure from Britain. And the dragon gave him his power. Just back up a few verses to chapter 12, and the Bible tells us that that dragon is that old serpent, the devil. So what this, if I read this verse in modern terms, the beast I saw was like the European Union. His feet were like Russia. His mouth was like the mouth of Britain, perhaps King Charles. And the devil gave them his power and his seat and great authority. Is that plain enough for you? And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. And I explained to you last night that that was the Third Reich. Europe has had four heads. The Holy Roman Empire was the first head. The German Empire was the second head. The Hitler Nazi Empire was the third head. That's the head that was wounded to death. That's when they divided Germany and Berlin, gave half of it to the communists, and the other half to the West. And then years later, under Ronald Reagan's term, Mikhail Gorbachev reunited Germany and the deadly wound was healed. So that is the fulfillment of verse 3. So the head was wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast. And all the world there can be a reference to the New World Order because from those days we've seen the, the powerful rise of the United Nations and the New World Order. And they worshiped the devil the dragon, which gave power to the beast. God, as I want to tell you, this new world order is satanic. Yeah. If you haven't seen that, you've not been paying attention. These people literally work. In fact, if you want to go to the speech that Vladimir Putin just gave this week, and I know you're hearing a story in the media in this country that Putin is the aggressor in Ukraine. But the fact is the United States CIA and all the corrupt powers we got down here have been using Ukraine for years to do dirty criminal activities. And Vladimir Putin says we're going on here to get those criminals out of there. And he said the West has begun to practice Satanism. Now what does that tell you? When a communist is fighting against the West because we have turned to Satanism in the West. And I'm not saying Vladimir Putin is right or wrong. I'm simply saying it is observable fact, it's a provable fact that Satanism is pervasive in the bureaucracy and the politics of the Western powers. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to, you, well, I don't know what to tell you. You're going to have to quit watching and listen to the mainstream media and start listening to alternative news. If you haven't heard of child trafficking, if you haven't heard about child sacrifices and satanic rituals at the highest levels of our government, then you don't understand. Okay. They worshiped the dragon which gave power to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, who's like to, the beast and who's able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things. That's that mouth of Britain. Great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 42 months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell on the earth. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. This applies to you and me because we are the saints. It was given unto him to make war with the saints to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. We've got some prophecy preachers who have said that because the United States has been compassionate to Israel, we will not have to go through the mark of the beast. That could not be any further from the truth. When the Bible plainly says that power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. This beast will rule the United States as well as every other nation. And all that dwell on the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. 
And if any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. And he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here's the patience and the faith of the saints. What that says is, after all the death and destruction, saints keep the faith because you're going to have a great glorious victory when it's all over. I will continue very quickly because it's the only way I know to really introduce so many subjects so quickly and explain them all. He said, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. This is the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. He looks like a lamb, but he talks like the devil. He presents himself as the vicar of Christ, but there could be nothing further in the earth from Christ himself than the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. He exercised all power of the first beast before him, which causes the earth and them that dwell in them to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. What this tell us? is that the Pope is in collusion with the world government. The Pope and the world government are in the bed together. They are all in this cahoots. Everything the world government wants to do, the Pope is behind it. Everything the Pope wants to do, the world government cooperates with him. The Pope and the New World Order is one and the same. The Catholic Church is not anything you want to be a part of in these end times. Read on up a few chapters where it said, Come out from among them, my people, and be not partaker of their evil deeds. Is that right? That was talking about the great whore, which is the Roman Catholic Church. Don't let Catholicism intimidate you. The church of the living God is greater than the Roman Catholic Church. And the spirit of Christ is greater in you than the spirit that's in that Catholic Church. And he does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. I'm telling you the day is going to come in the near future when we're going to see amazing miracles at the hand of the Pope. It may or may not be Francis. Francis is 85 years old. He wants to retire. We may see another Pope before this thing is over. I don't know. I can't say. But we are going to see a Pope that's going to call fire down out of heaven. And we're going to see somewhere in this the image of the beast. Ask yourself, what is the image of the Roman Catholic Church? Does anybody know what the image of the Roman Catholic Church is? Anybody want to guess? Has anybody seen any images in the Virgin Mary? The image of the Roman Catholic Church all over the world is the image of the Virgin Mary. And for what it's worth, that's not the Virgin Mary. That's a devil. Virgin Mary's in heaven. She don't have a clue what's going on in the world today. She is not the mother of God. She's the mother of the son of God. And so he does great wonders. So he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth inside of men. He deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. So he's saying to the European Union, we're going to make an image to the beast. And that exactly what happened several years ago when the European Union called for a new flag and a new emblem for this European Union. It was designed by a Roman Catholic artist who said, we're applying the 12 stars of the Virgin Mary to the European Union. I was in Brussels several years ago in the Cathedral of St. Michael and I was taking pictures and one of the largest images of Mary in the world is inside that cathedral and it has... It's way up on a pedestal, way up high, and it has the 12 stars of Mary around her head, and her foot is on top of a serpent. And there's great symbolism in that, that the Catholic Church believes that Mary is actually the one that's going to bruise the head of Satan in the end of days. And that's exactly not what the Bible says. The Bible said Jesus is the one that's going to bruise Satan's head when he comes. And the 12 stars over the Virgin Mary in the Catholic image or a plagiarism of the 12 tribes of Israel, which image was depicted in Revelation 12. When you read Revelation 12, he sees a woman with 12 stars. And that is the depiction of the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel has 12 tribes. And the nation of Israel is the mother of Christ. Israel produced all the ancestors of Jesus. Israel produced the mother of Christ. And Israel as a nation is the mother of the man child that was caught up to heaven. And after he was born, after Jesus went to heaven. So the image of the Catholic Church being the Virgin Mary is the ultimate in blasphemy. Because it blasphemes the whole gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Catholic Church has made an image to that one world government and you'll see the image of Mary all over the world. How many hundreds of front yards you've got right here with images of the Virgin Mary in it? Go to any Catholic church anywhere in the world, you're going to see the big elevated image of Mary. You're going to see parades all over the world. They have their annual celebrations where hundreds of thousands of people march through the streets as they give homage to the Virgin Mary. And all of this is the image of the beast. 
And he had power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. I, I, I expect, now you've probably heard in times past that the Catholic Church has had many so-called apparitions of the Virgin, many appearances of the Virgin. You've got Our Lady of Fatima, Our Lady of Guadalupe, Our Lady of Medjugorje. They've, there's sites all over the world where they've had visions of the Virgin Mary, and she's given them all these messages that the Catholic Church has, has ruled on that, that was sacred and holy. And in many of those places, they have a phenomenon where the images themselves either bleed or drip oil or drip tears. There are images of Mary that cry, that weep. There are images of Mary that drip oil. There are images of Mary that drip blood. There are Catholics sometimes in these annual celebrations around, around Easter season that they literally flagellate themselves. And there are, there are many high-level Catholics have had uh, appearances of what they call stigmata, where because of their worship of the very Virgin Mary, their hands begin to bleed like the, like the hands of Christ. These are miracles being performed by the Roman Catholic Church. And the power of those miracles is the power of Satan himself. And this verse says before it's over, one of these images, he said, he caused the image of the beast should both speak and caused that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. I suppose that in the last days there's going to be an event where there is going to be an image of Mary begin to speak to the crowds and those who doubt it will literally die in that audience. The Pope's going to be a more and more fearful figure on the world stage before this is over. And he causeth. We're still talking about the lamb that speaks like a dragon. This is the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. Verse 16 says, He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him, him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. It's the number of a man. His number is 600, three score, and six. I'm going to jump down to the ninth verse of the next chapter. Third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. So the overview of all that is the fact that the Roman Catholic Church is indeed a principal player in all these end time events. The Pope himself is going to be a world focus as we see the coming of the Lord approach. And in the great tribulation, this verse tells us that it is the Pope himself that introduces the mark of the beast. You say, where it's coming from? I know where it's coming from. It's coming from the central bank of central bankers in Basel, Switzerland. It's called the Bank for International Settlements. All the central banks in the world operate off of that hub in Basel, Switzerland. But in the reality of it is the whole European Union is run more than anything else by the Roman Catholic Church. In uh, years past, one of the secretaries general of the European Union was a man named Herman Van Rompuy. And he was on the record as saying of the leadership of the European Union, and he spoke not only of what was in Brussels, Belgium, but about the European Parliament in Strasbourg, France, and all the other uh, extended organizations that run the European Union. He said, we're all Jesuits. Do you know what a Jesuit is? A Jesuit is one of the orders of the Roman Catholic Church. 1500s, Ignatio de Loyal's created what was called the Society of Jesus. It's the Pope's powerful army. Ignatius de Loyal vowed to the Pope in his day 
that they would do anything on earth for the Pope, whether it was to kill or steal or destroy. He made it clear they would take down kings and princes. They would murder whoever needed to be murdered. If anybody hindered the Pope or the Catholic Church, the Jesuits were ready to do anything. They would go into political arenas. They would infiltrate governments. They would infiltrate state houses. They would infiltrate business and commerce. And the Jesuits would find an ever presence in all the leadership of the world. And we've seen it over the last 500 years to where that even in our own Congress halls, our own congressional people are being influenced and manipulated by Jesuits of the Roman Catholic Church. I had a picture a few years ago, I posted on my website of Barack Obama sitting there with his cabinet. And in that cabinet room, the 12 most powerful men in Barack Obama's cabinet, 11 of them had Jesuit schooling. They were trained in Jesuit universities. What does that tell you about that kind of an administration? It tells you that the Roman Catholic Church is pulling strings in governments. If you go to the United Nations today, you'll find over 300 non-governmental organizations that operate inside the building of the United Nations. All those NGOs are owned and operated by the Roman Catholic Church. The Catholic Church has got its tentacles into the United Nations. When you go to the World Economic Forum, the people that orchestrated the COVID pandemic, Klaus Schwab, Bill Gates, Anthony Fauci, George Soros, and all these, King Charles was there, Prince Charles was there, uh, the people from Europe and all, these people were mentored. Klaus Schwab, who is now up in his 80s, he founded the World Economic Forum in 1971, was mentored by a New World Order guy named Henry Kissinger and by an archbishop of the Catholic Church who was the father of their textbook on liberation theology. Liberation theology is Catholic communism. So the man that tutored and mentored Klaus Schwab, leader of the World Economic Forum, was trained by New World Order chief Henry Kissinger and by the Catholic Church's own bishop who devised Catholic socialism. So we're headed for a Catholic socialistic world. Can you see that? Yeah. In fact, the Bible calls that beast a scarlet colored beast. Red is the color of revolution. It's the color of blood. When you go back to the French Revolution, all of its colorings were red. It was a bloody revolution. When you go to the Bolshevik Revolution, 1917 Russia, the books that were being used were Karl Marx's book on communism, and it was all printed up in red. The flags of the communist revolutionaries in Russia all carried red flags. When they took Europe in World War II, they hoisted that red communist flag over the German Reichstag, and that is the scarlet colored beast that we're gonna be living under in the last days. And so I want to, with God's help, put a picture in your mind of how this is all gonna transpire. I want you to see this seven-headed, ten-horned beast. The seven heads is a British head, a Russian head, because it's the bear. The lion is Britain. The bear is Russia. The four heads of the leopard is the European Union. And the ten-horned dreadful beast, that is, the Bible said that fourth beast was diverse from all the others. Yeah. All those other ones were sovereign nations. But this ten-horned beast is a world government coming up. Whereas these first three ruled over bounded territories called nations, this last beast has no borders. He rules the whole world. He's diverse from all the others. And he has ten horns and it has seven heads. Those seven heads are Britain, Russia, Europe, and I'll just say the United Nations. I think that the name could even change. It could end up being called something else before it's over with. But those seven heads, if you get a hold of that, then it makes you realize that the people who are going to oppress us, and remember they're all in cahoots with the Catholic Church. And I mean to tell you that the World Economic Forum was tutored by the Catholic Church. If you knew all the roots of it all, Henry Kissinger was tutored by the Catholic Church. And so many of these guys, and then Klaus Schwab at the World Economic Forum says that he tutored Justin Trudeau in Canada. He tutored Vladimir Putin of Russia. He said he tutored Emmanuel Macron of France. And he is like this, bosom buddies with King Charles of 
Britain. So what's the summary of all this? The Catholic Church tutored the World Economic Forum. The World Economic Forum tutored all the great leaders of the world today. Or I, I call them euphemistically the great leaders. They're treacherous traitors of the world. I'm trying to really drill it into your mind that the Catholic Church is running all the show right now. And so the ten horns, we can't even define them yet. We don't even know because the Bible said these kings have no power, but they receive power one hour with the beast. And they give their kingdoms to the beast. This is ten sovereign nations who have, from their very launching, committed themselves to a globalist agenda. If you look at the world economic situation right now, you can see financial and economic collapse is about to wrap the whole world up. Wall Street is in bigger trouble than we've seen it in our lifetimes. Global economies. Does anybody know that the United States of America is over $30 trillion in debt? Can you even say $30 trillion? We got 350 million people. Are 350 million people ever going to pay off a $30 trillion debt? Does anybody know what happens when a country gets that deep in debt? They collapse. And it's an orchestrated collapse. And I could spend hours here just telling you the history of the Roman Catholic Church and the United States government. This country is run by Catholics. But the big picture is that when these ten kings rise, and I mentioned the other day that it's very possibly going to be a military alliance in Europe. Europe's on the verge of collapse right now. Europe's economy is worse than ours. The German banks, Deutsche Bank, Credit Suisse, the largest banks in Europe right now are just about to fold up. And if and when they do, Europe is going to just completely go through a complete it's like the Freemasons teach this doctrine of ordo ab chaos. The Latin is ordo, O-R-D-O, A-B, C-H-A-O, which means order out of chaos. You see that, that New World Order crowd out there, they believe that the way to take control of the world is to crush it first and raise it up from the ruins. And that's why they use the figure of the phoenix. The phoenix is not a real bird, but it's a legend, it's a, it's a symbol of rising from the ruins. They said that the phoenix, ever 500 years, killed itself in its own funeral pyre, and it rose up again with a new life. And so the phoenix is a symbol of raising from chaos, and that's the symbol. And if you didn't know this, I'll just throw this at you without any explanation. The Roman Catholic Church rules all the secret orders like the Freemasons, the Scottish Rites, the Rosicrucians, and all that stuff. Some of the most high-level mystics in all of those ranks is on the record saying that the highest degrees of all the secret orders, like the Freemasons and such, above the 33rd degrees, were written by the Jesuits in the College of Claremont in Paris, France. So if you know all the secrets that goes with the secret orders, then you realize that all these secret orders here that's working in Washington, D.C. and in your state capitals and all, these people at the very top, behind the scenes, behind the curtain, like the Wizard of Oz, is the Jesuits and the Pope. And they got what they call the Black Pope. They call the one that's out the visible in front of everybody, he's the White Pope. But the guy that runs the Jesuits, they call him the Black Pope. He's the General Secretary of the Jesuits. And he's the guy that really pulls the strings of the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, the White Pope answers to the Black Pope. The Jesuits are really what rules the world in behalf of the Roman Catholic Church. And so we're going to see this orchestrated collapse of Europe and we're going to see it rising from the ruins. And according to the prophecies, there'll be 10 great nations rise and they will be from the get-go committed to this globalist new world order. They will receive power one hour with the beast. Now who's the beast? That's this alliance of Britain, Russia, Europe, and the new world order. Shall we say the World Economic Forum? Shall we say the United Nations? Okay, so just about the time you catch on to this big picture, you go back to the book of Daniel and kind of have to start all over. So go with me to the book of Daniel chapter 7, and I'm going to show you some other information that has to be integrated with the story I just told you. Because the fact is, it's Daniel 7 where we learned that the lion was Britain, and the bear was Russia, and the four-headed leopard was the Franco-German Empire, that is the European Union today. 
And this is the first reference to the ten horns in Daniel chapter 7. And so I'm going to begin with Daniel chapter 7 and verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. Does anybody know what iron represents politically? Communism. You ever heard of the Iron Curtain? He said he had great iron teeth, had great communist teeth. And it devoured and break in pieces. I saw just a thumbnail of a video the other day of all the nations that have collapsed in the last 10 years. Failed states, they call them. There were literally dozens of them. We've got countries all over the world whose economies are failing, their governments are failing. The countries are in great distress right now. And I have to tell you, a whole lot of that is being managed by the powers that be. There's a lot of small nations that would get along right well on their own because they've got some bright, intelligent leadership, but they're being manipulated into obscurity because the great powers want to take them down. If you've ever heard of colonialism that dates back 100 years, the British Empire, and it's not far from the concept of colonialism, but this world government is intent on taking control of every nation on earth. This is not Pollyanna thinking. This is not high in the sky. This is not some fantasy or math. This is stuff you and I are not going to see. We are seeing it right now with our very eyes. We're hearing it on the news right now. And he said, he devoured and stamped and break in pieces. Do you, do you f get a feeling that they're trying to turn Americans against one another? Do you see this new world order trying to divide our country up? You see how that California has become almost an enemy state to us? We got even Texas is talking about seceding from the Union. New York has become an almost uninhabitable place. New York politics are unbelievable. You've got crime rampant all over our country. The country is more divided today than probably any time in modern history. And it's a political agenda run by the globalists. They want to weaken our country. You divide and conquer. That phrase is as old as the hill. You divide them and conquer them. And that's what the Bible said. They would devour and break in pieces. Chapter 7, verse 7, he stamped the residue with the feet of it, and he was diverse from all the other beasts but which were before it and had ten horns. So this is that last world government that we're seeing rising up right now. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, his hair of his head like the pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels are a burning fire, fiery stream, and came forth before him thousands, thousands ministered to him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, the books were open. I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld till the beast was taken and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. This is a wake-up call in the middle of a real complicated story. He's describing this ten-horned kingdom. And he stops and said, but I see God on his throne. And I see all these kingdoms falling, and I see God ruling over all. He's talking about the Ancient of Days. And he said concerning the other beast, he said this beast, this world government beast, was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. That correlates with Revelation 19.20 when the Bible said that when Jesus comes, he's going to take the beast and the false prophet and throw them both alive into the lake of fire. If you'll go to the book of Isaiah, the very last chapter... The last two verses. It shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. You remember me telling you last night that during the millennial kingdom of Christ, all the nations of the world are going to flow in and out of Jerusalem? He said in one prophecy, those nations that would not come and visit Jerusalem, there would be no rain on them. Did you know that was in the Bible prophecies? The people that refuse to worship the Lord Jesus Christ during the millennium, they will literally be served with drought by the hand of God until they finally relent. That's one of the things that's talked about when it says that Jesus is going to rule the world with a rod of iron. He is literally going to rule the world very strongly, very powerfully, very authoritatively. But during this millennial kingdom, verse 23 says, It will come to pass that from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. That's speaking of Jerusalem. And they shall go 
go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. I take that to mean that these two men that were cast alive into a lake of fire by Christ when he came at the battle of Armageddon, that their carcasses will never be consumed for a thousand years. And wherever it is, and I suspect it's going to be there on the south end of the Temple Mount, because that little valley that runs around out of the Kidron Valley is called the Valley of Gehenna or the Valley of Hell. It's variously called the Valley of Tophet, the Valley of Hinnom, the Valley of Gehenna. It's the valley of hell. In ancient times before Israel claimed that property, the pagans in its day used to make child sacrifices by burning them alive in that valley. In the days of Israel inhabiting that region, that was a trash dump where the fires never went out. They always took their refuge out of Jerusalem to the valley of Tophet, and there they burned them there. And in, I suspect that's probably where Jesus will dump the beast and the false prophet alive. And, the, and that Isaiah verse said their carcasses will never be quenched. For a thousand years, people will be able to walk by the beast and the false prophet, the pope and that Islamic man of sin, and see their bodies continue to burn for a thousand years. And so back to Daniel 7. Verse 13, I saw a night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, came to the ancient days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given unto him dominion and glory and kingdom, and all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So we bring Jesus Christ to this picture. This is re reminiscent of the stone hewn out of the mountain that's going to destroy all those kingdoms. Daniel chapter 2. The stone came and crushed all the kingdoms and his stone became a great mountain and filled all the earth. And that's what Jesus is coming to do. And verse 15, Daniel was grieved in his spirit in the midst of his body. I came near to one that stood by and asked him the truth of all this he told me and made me know the interpretation these great beasts which are four kings which shall rise out of the earth but the saints of the most high shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever and ever now this is something we've got to always remind ourselves even as we go through the final 42 months of the greatest tribulation of the world the saints are going to take the kingdom when this is over this is Satan's last stand and you might as well know for 6,000 years he's been waiting to have this Armageddon war with Jesus Christ and I got to tell you, we already know who's going to win. Satan's a fool, but he's not stupid. He's coming in great vengeance. The Bible said, he's woe to the inhabitants of the earth, for the devil's cast down, and he comes in great wrath, for he knows he has but a short time. He's got 42 months to wreak havoc on the earth, but the truth of it is, Jesus is going to come. The saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. Then would I know the truth of the four beasts, which was diverse from all the others. There's a big point. This, this new world order is different from anything the world's ever seen. Now, we've had an Egyptian empire in antiquity. We had a Babylonian empire. We had the Persian empire. We had the Grecian empire. We've had the Roman. We've been many empires on earth, but we've never had a truly global empire that covered everything from the north to the south to the east to the west. And it's different in its nature. It's exceeding dreadful. Its teeth were of iron, its nails of brass. That speaks of the ancient Grecian Empire. I'd have to get into that another time. Its devour break in pieces and stamp the residue with its peace. Guys, this is a deadly government. It is a bloodthirsty government. This is a government that is intent on bringing the population of the world down from 8 billion to 500 million. Have you heard that in the news? They got a price on our head, buddy. And they are heartless. These people are heartless. And that spirit, oh, well, I wish I could preach a whole sermon just on the spirit of this age. It's a spirit. There's nobody sitting up in a building. I mean, I say the Roman Catholic Church has run this, but those guys in the Catholic Church, they don't know what they're up to. It's the devil behind it. You think that man in Rome, in the, in the Society of Jesus, comprehends all these prophecies? Not on your life. He has no idea what he's doing. This stuff was orchestrated by the Holy Ghost. When Satan rose up against God, says, I will do this to you, and all of this is God's plan. 
end. How do you think these prophecies could ever even be written except that God knows the end from the beginning? But there's bigger truth to that. Not only does God know the end from the beginning, but God Almighty orchestrates the end from the beginning. He choreographs it. He will lead a righteous man in righteousness and he'll lead a wicked man into more wickedness. That's the way God operates and he's bringing all this to the war of all the ages and it's going to be Jesus Christ against all the enemies of God and it's going to be horrific. It's a war for the souls of men, those four spirits of those four horsemen. They're trying to take down the world. They all want to roll. Communism wants to conquer. Catholicism wants to conquer. Islam wants to conquer. Capitalism wants to conquer. I used to think capitalism was the only innocent party. But now that I know about the CIA and the FBI and the Department of Justice and all the corruption, I say not, not even capitalism is innocent. They're all demon spirits. Verse 20, chapter 7, Daniel. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, before whom three fell. I have to take you back to the eighth verse for a second. He said he saw these horns, and behold, there came among them a little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. This is bigger than everything I've said tonight. You have to interlace the Revelation 13 story with this little horn prophecy. Revelation 13 doesn't mention little horn specifically, but you can't interpret Revelation 13 without the little horn prophecy because the ten horns relate to Revelation 13, but Revelation 13 doesn't specifically mention the little horn. You will see in the 13th chapter of Revelation that power was given to that beast to have power for 42 months. Revelation 13 says the beast has power for 42 months. But it also says the same thing in Daniel chapter 7 and 8. He said in verse 8, chapter 7, I considered those horns, speaking of the ten horns, and behold there came up among them a little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold in the horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and mouth speaking great things. Now we're going to go back to verse 20. And the ten horns that came up that were in his head of the three of the other that came up, speaking of the little horn, before whom three fell, even of that horn that had an eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. Think of that for a minute. The little horn is more stout than the ten horns. The little horn is more stout than the fellows, than the ten horns. So what does that do to Revelation 13? That definitely puts an effect on Revelation 13. That means that after this seven-headed, ten-horned beast has come to power. There's still another big change coming. And that's when this little horn shows up. He said, I beheld, verse 21, the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Do you remember that being said in the 13th chapter of Revelation? The beast is going to make war with the saints and prevail against them. Until the Ancient of Days came. What's, who's that? That's the Lord of Glory. And judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. That's the first resurrection and rapture of the church and the great and final battle of Armageddon all in one package. Before whom three fell, and in verse 24 he said, The ten horns of this kingdom or ten things that shall rise of another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue the three kingdoms. So listen to this. He shall pluck up, they will fall, and he will subdue them. Three nations in Europe are going to be conquered by an outsider. Three of the ten horns. I want you to imagine this. These ten horns are already said to be the most powerful forces on earth at that time. They are the force of the new world order. These ten nations have surrendered their sovereignty to the new world order. They are, in effect, the new world order's army. But this little horn's going to come in there, and he is going to cause three of those ten horns to be plucked up. They're going to fall and be subdued. So there is a big value in knowing who in the devil is that little horn. Now, we've already established that that seven-headed ten-horn kingdom had the mouth of a lion. And I've already speculated that that's probably going to be King Charles III. We've known him all of our lives as Prince Charles. I really sincerely believe that King Charles is that prophesied mouth of the line. If I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. But what can I say? And so I think as this ten horn kingdom rises, Prince Charles will play an, a really major role in that new world order. And he's already showed that. He's at all these climate change 
conferences with the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab and the United Nations big shots. And so King Charles is not only on board with this New World Order, he is the New World Order. He's in cahoots with the Pope. Even though he's an Anglican, as the King of England, he is actually pledged to support the Church of England, the Anglican Church. But he is compromised. He's evil. I mean, when, but when you see all their pomp and ceremony, you've got to see through that and realize there's devils in that crowd, guys. For whatever power and authority King Charles may exercise during the early stages of the rise of that seven-headed, ten-horned kingdom, the day will come when his power is probably going to be usurped when that little horn comes up. Now, the Bible tells us that that little horn is going to be in power for 42 months, and that really puts a kink in this whole explanation. The ten horns, verse 23 of Daniel 7. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break in pieces. And the ten horns out of the kingdoms are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise out of them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. Now, when it says he shall be diverse from all the others, I take that to mean, and the reason I do is because I'm thinking about the Assyrian man of sin prophecies that I brought out to your attention the other night. Isaiah 14 says God is going to crush an Assyrian on his holy mountain when he comes. Micah chapter 5 verse 5 said that when Jesus comes, he's going to crush Assyrian in his holy mountains. Paul said the day of the Lord is not going to come until we see the man of sin arise. Who will oppose himself and exalt himself above all this called God as worship so that he is God sits in the temple showing himself that he is God. And we know that the beast is going to be destroyed by Christ when he comes. And what I propose to say to you tonight is in the earliest stages of this new world order, Britain will be a driving force. But I think what we're going to see, and I really think this is probably going to turn out, Islam is not going to be happy with this new world order. The Muslims are not going to like it. They have their own banking system. They don't believe in usury. And they have their own religion. Their God is a strange God that's prophesied. This little horn has a strange God. The Western world is Judeo-Christian. Whereas Islam has a strange God to the God of the Bible. And so he said, verse 25, He shall speak great words against the Most High and wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. That sounds like Islam because they have all different times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of times. One time is a year. Two times is two years. The dividing of times is half a year. Three and a half years. You've seen that all over the Bible. You see, it's 42 months. It's three and a half years. It's a time, times, and half a time. It's 1260 days. We got all kind of prophecies with those same three and a half years in it. And now this verse tells me that the little horn is going to be in power for 42 months. And what I know about that Assyrian is that he's going to sit in the temple in the middle of that last seven years. And he's going to commit the abomination at the very same time. He's going to have the armies of the world surrounding Jerusalem. And he's going to lay Jerusalem desert. So that man of sin, that Assyrian man of sin that walks into the temple and commits that abomination is going to be in power over the world for 42 months. And he's that little horn that goes over there and takes over three European nations and Islamizes them. Them. If you know your demographics in Europe right now, then you know that London, England right now has a Islamic mayor. In fact, there's about 30 major cities in Britain right now whose mayors are Islamic. It won't be hard. And all over Europe, the Muslims are extremely active in politics. They run for every office they can get in. They have their Islamic worship centers all over Europe. They have their imams. And you might as well believe they've got all their secret political and military operations running out of their mosques. And Recep Erdogan of Turkey is on the record saying, I've got a thousand mosques in Europe, and all I have to do is call up my imam brethren, and we'll take Europe. And I personally think, and this is just conjecture, speculation, I think Britain's going to be one of the first to fall. Because London is literally saturated with Muslims. Paris is saturated with Muslims. Germany is saturated. Would it be inconceivable nearly if in the middle of this last seven years, an Islamic little horn rose up and conquered Britain, France, and Germany, and for all practical purposes, took utter control of Europe and even of the New World Order? 
Now, we still got a Catholic church we got to deal with because the Pope is still going to be in business when Jesus comes because the false prophet's going to be one taken. But, and we also know exactly when the Catholic church is going to fall. If you go to the seven vials of the wrath of God, you're going to see in chapter 16... The seventh vial, an angel poured out his vial of the air, and it came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such not since men were on the earth, so mighty an earthquake. And that great city was divided into three parts. This is Mystery Babylon, or Rome. And the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came up in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell on men a great hail out of heaven." Uh, and ever stone the weight of a talent. That's about 60 pounds, I think they said. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hell, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. This is the last vial of God's wrath just before Jesus comes. And it's the destruction of Rome. And if you read another prophecy there, he said, Those ten horns shall hate the whore and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Those ten horns, you got to keep this in mind. Europe has always been Catholic. Since the Caesars fell, the Catholic Church took over Europe. When the Caesars lost control, it was the cardinals and bishops that took control of Europe. And Europe was built by Catholicism since the third century. Everything in Europe has been fundamentally Catholic. And so when you read that prophecy said that the ten horns of Europe are going to hate the whore, that's inconceivable. How could 10 Catholic nations want to destroy the Catholic Church? And the only solution is that the 10 horns have been overthrown by a little horn. And they have become influenced and controlled by the Muslims. And those three horns that fell into their control are now being used against the Catholic Church. And you got to know these guys are shrewd. They, they do tricks you and I would never even think of with their politics. I mean, they just dedicated that big world peace place over in UAE here last week or two. And they've got the bill into all the world's major religions. And they, say, they call it one world religion now. And it's basically Chrislam. And you and I both know that you can't put Christianity and Islam together now, can you? It doesn't work that way. But that's what's going to happen in the end. We're going to see this little horn rise up. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 7. I just read to you in verse 25 that he would change times and laws and they shall be given in his hand to, until time, times, and dividing time. But the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Now guys, what I believe this is saying is this little horn is the first beast that Jesus is going to meet on the temple mount and the second beast is the pope i believe what you're seeing here because it's under the prophecy pertaining to the little horn that says jesus is coming right did you see that jesus is coming back to settle the issue with the little horn how's he going to do that the little horn has taken over this new world order at the last minute and i don't mean for a long time this has just happened he's had great power since he committed the abomination of desolation in jerusalem but he's not run the new world order yet. But in the end of it, all of Islam. And you have to understand that this Turkish president, Recep Erdogan, Turkey was the seat. Istanbul was the seat of the ancient Ottoman Empire for 700 years nearly, 800 years. And the Ottoman Empire covered that entire region of the world in its day. It operated even the land of Palestine, which is now the state of Israel. It, it ruled way up into Greece and up into Eastern Europe. It ruled down into South Africa. It ruled for, all the way over into the Far East. And when the Ottoman Empire was overthrown in the World War I, 1917, they literally went to a committee and redefined the boundaries of Turkey in 1923 at the San Remo Conference. They redefined the boundaries of Turkey and effectively eliminated permanently the Ottoman Empire. But next year, listen to me, next year is the 100th anniversary of the redefining of the boundaries of Turkey after World War I. And President Erdogan has sworn that the year 2023 will be the year that he launches the rebuilding of the Ottoman Empire. 
You're going to see some political shenanigans coming out of the Islamic world in the next year or two that's going to blow your mind. He's already got troops down in Libya. He's fighting with Egypt down there. He's got troops in Ethiopia. He's got them down in Iran and Iraq. He's got a major exercise going on in Syria right now. He's pulling strings with the Russian bear. He's in cahoots with Russia right now. I don't have time to tell you all the shenanigans that President Recep Erdogan, but he has pledged himself to Hezbollah. He's pledged himself to Hamas. He's given millions and millions of dollars to the Palestinian Liberation Organization, to the Palestinian Authority. He has appeared several times in recent years on the Temple Mount. He has visited the Dome of the Rock. He has pledged to support East Jerusalem as a separate Palestinian state. And he is on the record saying that all the Muslims of the world need to join together and form a world Islamic army and they need to utterly destroy the state of Israel. And that's exactly what they're going to come to do in the middle of this week. When the man of sin walks in the temple and runs the Jews out of the new temple, he's coming with armies to take Jerusalem once and for all. And they will take Jerusalem for three and a half years until Jesus comes and takes it back. So the picture I want you to see is that world government with the mouth of the lion losing the mouth of the lion to the little horn. It started under the influence of Britain's great power. But... Islam threw a monkey wrench into the machinery and took over three of those ten horns. So let's finish this up. The man of sin is an Assyrian Muslim. The Antichrist is not a Jew. There's nothing in the Bible that supports that. In fact, there's another thing about the Antichrist that's a misconception, and that is that the Jews will receive him. There's nothing in the Bible that teaches that the Jews will receive the Antichrist. The Antichrist will not rise by treaty. He will rise by force. The Palestinian state will not come by a, an agreement. It will come by war. When Jesus comes at Armageddon, Jesus Christ will bruise Satan's head at Armageddon. And all of these enemies will defeat him. That will be the little horn, the Assyrian Muslim man of sin, and the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. Those are the two men that Jesus will crush on the Temple Mount. Now I want you to go with me to chapter 8 of Daniel. I'm going to bulldoze through this just as quickly as I can. There's a prophecy about a he-goat making war with a ram. Verse 5, as I was considering, behold, a he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. He came to the ram and had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran unto him with the fear of his power. And I saw him come close to the ram, and he was moved with collar against him, and smote the ram and brake his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great when he was strong, and the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of the heaven, and out of one of them came forth a little horn. Now that's why I needed to tell you this to, to you. This is another clue about who the little horn is. You have to understand this he goat and ram prophecy to know all you need to know about who the little horn's going to be. And, and the interpretation of that is right there in that chapter. Uh, verse 20, the angel Gabriel told Daniel, verse 20, the ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. Okay? And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. Now guys, get this. This is before it all happened. God showed this to Daniel even before the Medes and Persians conquered Belshazzar. God was showing Daniel the rise of the Medo-Persian Empire and the fall of the Medo-Persian Empire to the Grecians, which would only happen a century later. So we know that the he-goat was effectively Alexander the Great, who conquered the Persian Empire. It was the Persians that uh, conquered the Babylonians, but it was the Grecians who conquered the Persians. And now he's saying when the Grecian Empire falls, speaking of Alexander's empire, it's going to split up into four kingdoms. And that's exactly what happened. Alexander was a young soldier. He was only 33 years old when he died. They said before he died, he fell on the ground and wept because there were no more worlds to conquer. But when Alexander's Grecian Empire collapsed, it was split into four kingdoms. The two most preeminent of them was the Seleucid Empire on the north and the Ptolemaic Empire on the south. The Ptolemaic Empire is generally Egypt. The Seleucid Empire is generally Turkey and Syria. 
You had a Western kingdom over in the Grecian area, and you had a Middle Eastern kingdom right in the land of Palestine and Jordan. So you had one, two, three, four kingdoms came out of the Grecian Empire. That was Greece, Turkey, the Middle East, and Egypt. The Seleucid Empire was number two. The Egyptian Empire was number four. And the Bible said out of one of those four, listen carefully, out of one of those four come that little horn. So the question is, does the little horn come from Egypt? No. Does the little horn come from Palestine? No. Does the little horn come from Greece? No. Does it come from Turkey? Probably so. Because Turkey overlaps the ancient Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrian is already prophesied to meet Christ when he comes. The Assyrian and the little horn are the same guy. The little horn actually becomes the beast in the last scene. Does that make sense? The little horn becomes the beast in the last scene of these prophecies. In the first scenes of it, it was that mouth of the lion like King Charles. But when the three horns were plucked up, and the little horn rose, he was stronger than all the rest of them. And he's the one that ended up running the show when Jesus arrived. And he's got the Pope right there. And you gotta know if there's one thing the Catholic Church knows how to do. Hear me well. The Catholic Church knows how to survive. And they may burn up Catholic churches and they may burn up Rome if they want to, but they'll have a Jesuit somewhere hiding out trying to resurrect the thing. And I'm telling you, whatever they have to do, there will be a Pope still standing when Jesus comes, even though Rome may be left in ruins. So, i got to finish this. Chapter 8, out of one of these four, verse, verse 8, Therefore the he-goat waxed great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. What does that mean? He, he waxed strong toward the south. That's down toward Africa. And Erdogan is running all over Africa right now, trying to pigeonhole all those nations in cahoots with himself. And he magnified himself to the east. He's working with Iran and Iraq. And he made himself strong in the pleasant land. That's speaking of the holy land. Erdogan, in fact, when I go to Israel, when you're walking around in the Muslim quarter, there even in the old holy city, you're going to see pictures of Recep Erdogan plastered on the walls in the stores in the Muslim quarter because he is a hero to them because he supports the Palestinian state. And verse 10 says he waxed. Great even to the host of heaven and cast down some of the host of the stars to the ground and stamped them. This just means he's going to take over some countries before he is through. And it tells us, it's arguable right now that he's taken over Libya and Sudan. There's some, there's some nations right now that have Turkish troops in there right now. And there's fighting going on between Turkish armies and Egyptian armies in Libya right now. And this Bible said he's going to take down several nations and cast them to the ground. And verse 11 said, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. Now this is where we get back into spiritual warfare. The prince of the host is Michael. Michael is the prince of Israel. You see that in the 12th chapter of Daniel here. Michael is the one that's going to stand up in Israel's behalf when all this comes down to critical mass. And so this man is magnifying himself against the very powers of God over Israel. And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away. So it was not conjecture. This is literally in the prophecy that the little horn is the man of sin. He's the one that will take the sacrifice away. This is in Daniel 8 and 11. He magnified himself to the prince of the host, which is the prince of Israel, which is Michael. And by him, the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of the sanctuary was cast down. That's the abomination of desolation. And a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. This means armies were given to him against the holy temple because of the sins of Israel. This man of sin, this little horn, this Assyrian, this antichrist is going to be the one that commits the abomination. He is the one that's going to take away the daily sacrifice. He is going to have a host, an army. 
And that's exactly what Jesus said in Luke 21, 20. When you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, you know the desolation thereof is nigh. Who brought those armies? It was the little horn brought those armies. It was the Assyrian man of sin. It was the guy who committed the abomination of desolation. He has worked with all of those powers. He's worked with Gog and Magog, Russia. He's worked with Gomer and Tagarma, which is his own country, Turkey. He's worked with Persia, which is Iran. He's working with Ethiopia and Libya. When I saw the headlines here, if you months ago of what uh, Erdogan was doing down in Libya. I thought, dear God, that's exactly what the prophecy said. And he's going to bring all these armies against Jerusalem for 42 months. Then I heard one saint, verse 13, speaking. Another saint said to a certain saint which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said to me, until 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And this got to be a real complicated thing for me because if this man of sin stands up 42 months before Jesus comes back, this verse says it's 2,300 days before the sanctuary is cleansed. 2,300 days. That's 6.33 years. What I take that to mean is it's going to be 6.3 years before Jesus actually moves into the new temple. He's saying there won't be a new sanctuary for 2,300 days after the man of sin goes into that old sanctuary, which puts us into the thousand years millennial kingdom of Christ. If it's 2,300 days from the time of the abomination and the casting out of the sacrifice, if it's 6.3 years, that takes us two years into the millennium, which is logical because the Bible said in the book of Zechariah that the Messiah himself is going to rebuild that temple. And if you know anything about what God's going to do, you'd have to know that that temple is going to be far more beautiful than anything the world has ever seen. Does anybody believe the new temple is going to be gorgeous? How many think the new temple will be prettier than the Palace of Nations in Geneva, Switzerland? You think it'll be prettier than the Congress Halls in D.C., prettier than the Kremlin? How many think God's kingdom on this earth is going to be more beautiful than anything the world's ever seen? And so do you think, does it make any sense that it will take Jesus Christ two years to have that temple built? And I'm not going to argue this point, I'm just speculating. But now let's go into verse 23. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, who are the transgressors? Israel. The transgressors are Israel. When they're come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power, and he shall destroy wonderfully. This is the same guy, folks. This is still the man of sin. This is still the little horn. This king of fierce countenance, his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. That means he's demon possessed. He shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper in practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. You got that? Zechariah 13, 7 and 8 said he's going to kill two thirds of the Jews and one third of them are going to be tried in the fire like gold and silver. So he shall destroy the mighty and holy people through his policy. Also, he shall cause craft which means deception, to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. But he also shall stand up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken without hand. What does that mean? That means this Assyrian man of sin, little horn, Antichrist, is going to be broken without hand by Jesus Christ when he comes. Guys, I get goosebumps when I get to thinking that if, if this is really what I'm seeing, if Recep Erdogan really is the candidate for that job, I may have already seen the guy that Jesus Christ is going to crush when he comes. And I can't say a million percent positive on that, but for all the other prophecies that I know and understand, it's almost inevitable. We are in the last days, church. Now go to the 11th chapter of Daniel. Let's finish this up. Now, I can only tell you that the first part of Daniel is all about ancient times. It speaks of the Maccabean period between the Old and the New Testament. But in verse 35 of Daniel 11, he starts talking about the end times. Verse 35, some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. Now, the rest of these verses are about the end time. Verse 36, and the king shall do according to his will. We're still talking about the little horn. Still talking about the Syrian man of sin. This king of fierce countenance, verse 36, shall do according 
to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that is determined shall be done. What is the indignation? That's that period of time that God is judging Israel for their sins. You read the ninth chapter, he said, Seventy weeks are determined on my people to finish their transgressions, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So the whole purpose, guys, of all these Daniel prophecies is to make an end of the sins of Israel and to bring Jesus Christ down in and establish peace and righteousness in the earth. And that's where we're headed. So now the 11th chapter says... That verse 36, this evil king shall do according to his will and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods. Why? Because he's a Muslim. He doesn't worship Jehovah, Jesus Christ. He worships Allah and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, till Israel's sins are accomplished for that he it is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. This Muslim does not regard Christ or Jehovah. He regards only Allah, which is a strange God, nor does he regard the desire of women. How do you know Muslims don't respect women's rights? And he shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, until God has finally taught the Jews their last lesson. The whole point of this is to bring Israel to repentance. The whole point of all these prophecies is to bring Israel to their knees. And when Jesus finally comes to save them after they've been through 42 months of living hell, when they look upon him whom they pierced, they're going to weep and mourn and repent of their sins. And he says, I'm going to fill them with my spirit. I'm going to give them a new heart of flesh and I'm going to write my laws in their hearts and they're going to live before me. So God is saying the whole point of this is to have a revival among the Jews. I brought their worst enemy, the Assyrian little horn man of sin, Antichrist, and destroyed everything around them. And now, Jesus is going to come. And let's finish this. Verse 38, but in his estate he'll honor the God of forces, a God whom his fathers knew not. That's speaking of Allah, not Jehovah. A God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold, silver, and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, which is Allah, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. He shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. This is, the, this is pertaining to the division of Jerusalem. He will divide the land for gain. That's why I say there's not going to be a peace treaty that's going to bring in a Palestinian state. Because this verse right here specifically said that a Syrian man of sin is the one who's going to divide the land for gain. And it's not going to be by treaty. It's going to be by force. It's going to be by war. It's going to be by surrounding Jerusalem with armies and conquering it. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God. He shall acknowledge and increase the glory and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, which is Egypt, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind in chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries. He shall enter into the glorious land, which is Palestine, Israel, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. Edom, Moab, and Ammon is all the state of Jordan. The Edomites and Moabites lived in Jordan, modern Jordan, and Ammon is actually the capital of Jordan, Ammon. And he shall stretch forth his hand upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. They're at war right now with Egypt. Turkey and Egypt's at war this very minute. And he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver over all the precious things of Egypt and over Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. Who knows? Maybe Putin will try to slow him down or stop him. Whatever the powers that be that try to slow him down is going to aggravate him and is going to make him be even more vicious when he assaults Israel in the last overthrow. And he shall plant the tabernacle of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. This means the man of sin, when he walks into that temple in the middle of that week, he's going to stay in Israel probably. He's going to have his own palace in Israel. Between the seas means between the Mediterranean Sea and the Dead Sea right there in Jerusalem. He's going to plant his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall 
help him. What's that? That's the second coming of Jesus Christ. And at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince, chapter 12, which stands for the children of the people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found in the book. This is speaking about the second coming. And if you jump down to verse 6, one man clothed in linen which was on the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen which was upon the waters of the rivers when he held his right hand and left unto the heaven and swore by him that lived forever and ever for time, times, and half when he, when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So there's another redundant statement that this man is going to be in power for 42 months. That is three and a half years. And when he has scattered the holy people, killed two-thirds of them, put one-third of them through the tribe, and brought them on their knees to repentance, then Jesus is going to come and save them. And so chapter 12, verse 8 says, I heard, but I understood not. Then I said, O oh, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? He said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but that wickedly shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination make a desert set up, shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and 30 days. And what's that mean? That three and a half years is that 1290 days and he's talking about an extra 45 days. The only sense I can make of that is that maybe going to be the period of time that the whole battle of Armageddon takes. I suspect that Russia and all these armies are going to be in full throttle when Jesus shows up in the clouds. I think that Armageddon battle is probably going to last 45 days of full all-out warfare. And that's why he says, blessed are those that survive that last 45 days. If you survive the battle of Armageddon, you've really, you've really done something special. But when Jesus comes, all of this is over. And here's where you and I have got to have our solace. I don't want to send you home to have a bunch of nightmares. I'm going to be totally honest with you. I've been preaching this stuff for decades. It scares the fooey out of me. But I had to come to a point where I said, I can't live in fear of this stuff. There's hope beyond the grave. And that's the whole story of all the saints of all the ages. Any of the saints you want to talk about, they had their own time of tribulation. Jesus said, in this world you shall have tribulation. In this world you shall have affliction. He said, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You know what really got me excited about that statement? When, when I hear Jesus saying, I have overcome the world, I'm thinking about him raising from the dead. But you know what? He made that statement days before he ever went to Calvary. He had already claimed his victory before they ever came to get him. He said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Before they ever hauled him down to Pilate's hall, before they ever took him down to Caiaphas' house, before they ever scourged him, before they ever nailed him to the cross, before they ever laid him in the tomb, he said, I have overcome the world. And I'm going to say tonight, before it ever breaks out, I've already overcome this thing. I've already won this battle. It's in my soul. This is the victory that overcome the world, even our faith. I'm telling you, I've got a God that wrote this book. I'm not afraid of this story. This story was written by the God that saved my soul. He told me this to lift me up. The word of God is a lamp to my feet. It's a light to my path. I hide this word in my heart that I might not sin against God. He showed these things and revealed these things to me that I might be helpful and believe that he's going to see me through. And that's why every few verses he breaks in on this to say, but I saw the saints, they got the kingdom and they were given all the power and all of these enemies were crushed. And I'm telling you, you've got to keep that in your heart and mind. When they come to tell you, you got to take that mark. And you say, no, sir, I won't take that mark. And they say, why not? Because the Bible says I better not take it or I'm going to go to hell. And they're going to say, well, this is not going to send you to hell. You just believe in all that stupid religious stuff. You're going to say, no, sir, you can call it anything you want to. But I know what my Bible says. And you're not going to get me in a corner. I'm not taking that mark. I'm not going to 
bow down to that image. I'm not going to be a part of that one world religion or that one world government. I'm going to be a child of God. And if this is my last day on earth, so be it. Well, I know that when I go down, I'm going up in Jesus' name because at the last trump, the dead in Christ are going to rise and we which are alive and remain are going to be caught to meet him in there. And so shall we ever be with him. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. And that's my message to you tonight. Thank you for staying with me. I'll pass this video around. Tell others about it. Follow me on Facebook, Twitter, MeWe, Gab, CloudHub, BitChute, Rumble, YouTube, and go to my website at KenRaggio.com. Sign up for my daily Bible studies. Get on my mailing list so that I'll have you on my email list. If I lose Facebook and Twitter and everything else, if you're on my email list, then we'll, we'll still be able to get in touch with each other. I hope you do that. I also have a Telegram channel. Look down in the links below. I have a Telegram cha channel. I put some prophecy stuff up there every now and then. And uh, also, go to Amazon.com. Get that book, The Daniel Prophecies, God's Plan for the Last Days. Get all those books. Two great books, 1,428 pages. Uh, my Daily Bible Companion, it's, Volume 1 is the Old Testament Lessons. Volume 2 is the New Testament. Ba Bible Lessons from Every Chapter of the Bible. And then there's other books. Look them up on Amazon, books by Ken Raggio. There's, if you want all nine of them, there's a link below to get a $125 special here in the United States. I pay the shipping only within the continental United States, no other place. And if you can make a donation, there's a link down there to make donations. And I appreciate all your support. May the Lord bless you. Again, share this video with your friends, and I'll see you next time. Good night, and God bless you.